Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jen Barba and I'm a part of the Sloan admissions team. I'm also very lucky to be joined by several of my colleagues from the admissions office, Alexis Marcus, Pam Spencer, Catherine Farrar, and Rachel Ferreria. And we'll all be here behind the scenes to help with Q&A. Um, you know, the goal for our webinar today is to go through a quick um, set of slides that will give you some tips for the Sloan Fellows MBA application process with our upcoming deadline next week. Um, but we'd like for all of you to post your questions in the Q&A function. Um, we'll answer questions both live and behind the scenes. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so we'd like to begin every event that we do with the mission of the Sloan School, which is to which is to develop, excuse me, uh, principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and generate ideas that advance management practice. And as we bring students into the one year um, Sloan Fellows MBA experience, you know, that is our goal to help you to develop these tools and experiences to go on um, and uh, and be principled leaders in the future. This is a snapshot of the Sloan Fellows MBA or SF MBA class of 23. Um, so these students began in June of 22. Um, and we have 109 students in the class, about 70% are international students, 37% are women. On average, the class represents about 15 years of full-time work experience. That's um, at, uh, experience after graduating from their undergraduate degree. About half the class has um, additional advanced degrees, so um, other um, master's degrees. Um, and then, you know, you can see we're incredibly diverse in terms of industries represented, um, countries represented, um, and academic experiences. So we are, um, you know, hoping to continue this diversity in the class of 2024, which we have an upcoming application deadline for next week. Um, so an ideal candidate in the Sloan Fellows MBA um, is someone who has a little more experience. They have a minimum of about 10 years full-time work experience. Um, they have experience working in leadership or general management roles, meaning, you know, they're not only managing individuals, but they're managing teams, or they have um, experience in project management, managing large scale projects and large scale teams. Um, you know, we're looking for candidates who have global perspective, meaning, you know, they've been involved in, um, you know, either organizations or teams that represent um, multiple, uh, you know, global ideas, global ways of doing business that, you know, that they have experience that's beyond just the boundaries of the country that they live in. Um, you know, we're looking for people who are able to challenge the status quo and push boundaries, you know, people who are able to, you know, question the way we do things in a thoughtful way and, um, and help to develop new solutions, taking into account lots of different ideas. Um, it's also important that the people we bring into the Sloan Fellows MBA class are what we call quant comfortable. So we are an MBA program at MIT. There will be problem sets. There will be, um, you know, some, um, you know, a number of different quantitative aspects to the core curriculum and elective courses that you are asked to complete. Um, so we're looking for evidence of, um, of that quant comfort in a combination of factors from your past experience, work experiences, test scores, academic background, etc. Um, also, the program is in English, so, um, you know, you have to be able to effectively communicate both um, orally and in, in writing um, the English language. Um, and, you know, we're looking always for students who are committed to learning and self-improvement. And, you know, we will continue to give you many opportunities to do that even after you graduate from the program. So um, an overview of the application process. I know I know today's goal is really to answer all of the questions you have about the upcoming application deadline, but it's important to kind of give a quick overview of what the application consists of. Um, so next week on January 11th is the round two deadline um, for students to join the, the Sloan Fellows MBA class, which will begin um, the beginning of June uh, of this year. 
And so an application consists of a resume, which details out all of your um, past work experiences. Um, we ask you for a cover letter. This is kind of the equivalent of what maybe another application would say is their essay. So the cover letter is asking you to tell us, um, you know, a little bit about your background and why the Sloan Fellows MBA program is a good match for you. Um, and then we ask for an organizational chart. This is a great tool for us to better understand where you are within the organization you work in, what type of teams you maybe um, lead or um, have dotted lines to, where you sit within the organization in terms of which other departments or where the work that you're doing has influence within the larger organization you work. Um, we ask for one letter of recommendation. So Ideally, this letter would come from your current supervisor, um, but you know there are some um, some exceptions to that. Certainly, if you're an entrepreneur or if your um, current employer doesn't necessarily know you're applying to graduate school, um, but we ask for one letter and it has several um, specific prompts. We ask that recommender to speak to, so we're looking for some specific evidence to support the questions we ask for that letter. Um, and then we also ask for all of your past academic transcripts. This can include um, any uh, courses you've taken for degree credit or not. Um, so certainly with this population, many students or many applicants have gone on to get professional certifications or um, they've taken online courses for additional credentials. We want to see everything you've done that would be relevant to an MBA experience. And these transcripts are really great supporting evidence for us to understand that quant comfort we're looking for. Um, in addition, we ask for... Um, a test score. Um, this test score continues to be optional this year, however, due to the ongoing COVID um, pandemic. But you know, we welcome if you have taken a GMAT, a GRE, or an executive assessment exam to include that in your application. Um, and then we have a unique aspect of the application, which is a 60 second video introduction. So we ask you to record a 60 second video that introduces yourself to your hypothetical future classmates in the Sloan Fellows MBA experience. And it's a great tool for us to kind of better understand, um, you know, a bit more about what makes you you. And, um, you know, of course, it's important to, you know, get a sense of your communication skills and, um, maybe a, a bit of a summary of your background, but also we're hoping this can take us beyond what we can learn from your resume or other parts of your application. Um, there's two additional reference requests. So similar to if you were to apply for a job, in addition to your recommendation letter, we ask for two additional contacts um, that could so serve as a reference for us should we have additional questions. So um, we just need the contact information for two individuals. You know, um, best choices would be people you've worked with um, in a professional capacity in the past. Um, you know, we we don't always reach out to these individuals, but we may if we have additional questions. Um, and you know, don't worry, we would not cold call them. It would be you know an email we would send asking for um, a time to connect for a brief conversation, and the nature of the conversation would be very similar to the type of questions we ask on the recommendation letter. And then finally, we have an optional short answer question that allows for you to tell us a little bit more about your background and how you identify, um, you know, giving us a little bit more insight to, um, you know, a, a little bit more about what makes you you and, and how you identify um, within um, the kind of the, the background that you come from. And so the deadline is on January 11th. Um, and then after the first couple of weeks, um, we will send out um, interview invitations. I have a timeline I'll show with you on the next slide, but everybody who we admit needs to be interviewed, but interviews are by invitation only. So, um, you know, it will be a great sign if you get invited to interview. Um, and if you're interviewing with us, you'll meet with a member of our committee. Um, and that interview will be about 30 minutes on Zoom. 
Um, here, I'll give you the timeline for things. This kind of breaks down the timeline for the round two process. Um, so the deadline, as you see, is on January 11th. We'll take about two weeks to read through all of the applications and get out interview invitations by approximately January 26th, and maybe the 26th or 27th, um, depending on the application volume we receive. But um, we will confirm that for you in an email we send um, after the deadline. Um, so we expect um, to send invites out towards the end of January, and then interviews will take place through mid-February. And then we'll um, have our final meetings and get you a final decision on February 14th. As I said before, the interviews are by invitation only. Um, it's a behavioral interview that will be with a member of our admissions committee who will have already read your application. Um, and the interview will really consist of um, of questions that you know really relate to these competencies or um, characteristics that we've identified that make a successful uh, Sloan Fellows MBA student. Um, so, you know, additional aspects of the evaluation process, um, you know, all applications are reviewed. Every single application that comes in is reviewed by a member of our professionally trained admissions committee, and we're reviewing or reading these applications, um, looking for evidence of specific competencies that fall into these different categories we've outlined here, demonstrated success in leadership skills. So we're really looking for, um, you know, evidence of how well you work in a team, how do you solve problems and get your teams to buy into those problems that you've been able to solve? How do you communicate and adapt to change? How are you able to lead um, and influence others, maybe those who work um, for you and maybe those who don't necessarily work for you? Um, and then, you know, what type of success overall have you had in the work experience you've been doing to date? Um, and, you know, these combination of factors are all assessed during this reading process and that reading, um, those reader assessments determine who gets invited to interview. Um, and then once you're invited to interview, you interview during the interview, um, we're assessing a similar set of characteristics and competencies through behavioral questions that we'll ask you during the interview. Um, a few additional tips are, you know, remember that we are the admissions team and we're looking for reasons to admit you. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to dig into your applications and learn about your backgrounds. Um, the earlier you apply, meaning in the rounds that we've outlined, uh, unfortunately, round one has already passed. We have round two coming up next week and then round three coming up, um, you know, in March. You know, the earlier you apply, the better, because that means there's more seats still open to, to um, fill within the class. You know, the later you apply, the less options there are um, to be admitted because we've already admitted um, the, uh, students in earlier rounds. Um, also, if you apply in round two and you're not successful, we often have um, a wait list or we push applicants from round two into round three for reconsideration. So it can also extend your life as an applicant. Obviously, it's important to follow the directions and answer the prompts we're asking for. You know, we've carefully curated the questions that we ask in the application to um, correlate with the different uh, characteristics that we're looking to assess. Um, so the the best data you can give us is data that answers the questions that we've asked. Um, you know, be yourself. Try not to um, be overly coached or. Um, you know, we want an authentic um, analysis of who you are, both in the interview, through the cover letter, and through the different components of your application. And then similar to the first tip, you know, really think of us as your advocate. Um, myself and my colleagues here on the, the webinar and, and the rest of the team who's on the admissions committee, you know, it is our job to admit you. Think of us as your advocate in the process. Help us to have the information we need throughout this reading and interview process to advocate for you in these different decision meetings. So, you know, by following the directions and answering the prompts and kind of answering all of the things that we've outlined in the application that gives us the ammunition and the data that we need to advocate for you um, at each of these decision making points. All right, so I know there's a bunch of questions that have already been posted. There's questions in the chat. Um, how can I help? I'm happy to, you know, continue to answer questions live. I know we're answering some questions um, behind the scenes, but please post your questions in the Q and A. Um, unfortunately, we will not be using the raise hand function, um, but type your questions in the Q and A, and we'll get back to you.
All right. I've marked a bunch of them and we answered a bunch um, on the back end. But one of the ones that I saw that come in, that came in, a lot of questions about letters of recommendation. In particular, this person is not ready to disclose to their organization that they're leaving. So who could they ask for a letter of recommendation from? Yeah, I mean, um, if there's anyone you can confide in who has been, you know, a recent supervisor or someone who's ranked ahead of you within that organization um, that you feel you could confide in, that would be ideal because, you know, certainly the the most recent role you're in with, you know, I'll say like a significant amount of time will be um, a great resource for us to better understand the type of professional you are and the experience you've been able to um, accomplish. Um, however, if it's not possible, then maybe a previous supervisor from a prior role um, could be another option. Very helpful. Could you talk a little bit more about references? Should those be the same people who should be thinking about to ask for the additional letters or excuse me, additional names for the references? Yeah, a reference should be someone who would be similar to someone you would ask a letter of recommendation from. <laughs> So maybe that's where it's the previous supervisor or maybe, um, you know, it's a manager who's, um, you know, uh, a level above your current manager or someone who manages a, a team that's similar to yours, but maybe within a different department. You know, we're, we are looking for evidence of your professional success um, for the most part. And so, um, you know, use your best judgment. Um, if you happen to have a significant role in an outside organization, whether it be a nonprofit or a board you sit on, it might be an option to choose someone from um, a capacity like that as well. Okay, wonderful. I did see one question come in. Someone said that they were looking for the prompts that the recommenders would be asked. If you actually go into the application, it's right there in the application instructions, the different questions that they're asked. So you'll be able to see it there. It's also um, on the website on the website too, on the how to apply. I can link that in just a minute. Um, there was a question about folks that ha already have an MBA degree. Um, so two parts to that question. One, how do we view that? And two, um, would they be able to waive any of the courses and as part of the Sloan Fellows Program? Yeah, so because this is more of an executive MBA experience, it is okay for you to have earned an MBA in the past. We understand sometimes, um, you know, an individual may earn an MBA early on in their career and then go on to accomplish a bunch of different things and reprioritize their goals for the future. And um, Sloan Fellows can still align nicely. So certainly it's okay to apply if you've already received an MBA. Um, however, address it in your application, either talk about it in your cover letter or the optional question or in the video, you know, tell us why you're seeking a second MBA degree. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, using any of your previous coursework, unfortunately, that is not possible. Um, so be this is an accelerated program. It's just one year, 12 months. Um, MIT uh, Sloan has a core set of curriculum we need to follow. Everybody needs to complete that core curriculum. And then in addition to that, a number of elective credits um, in order to meet the degree requirements. And unfortunately, we do not take any transfer credit for this program. Great. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the international students and how they report their GPA? Should that match what's on the transcript? Should they be doing some sort of calculation? And then do we do they need any sort of an evaluation like from WES or anything of that sort? Yeah, so um, we do not require a WES or um, a Worldwide Educational Services um, uh, translation. However, um, you know, we ask for a couple of things. So um, if your transcripts are in a language that's not English, we would like for you to provide an English um, version of your transcript. Um, most schools provide this. Um, in addition, we want you to report your GPA based on the scale your um, transcripts talk about. So you do not need to convert your GPA to a 4.0 scale. Instead, if your GPA is on a 10 point scale, we want to understand you have, you know, an 8.9 out of 10. And we ask for you to identify um, for us what your um, grade point average is based on the scale your grades are shared in. Um, a lot of international transcripts are on a 10 or a 100 point scale, but whatever the case might be, you know, just define. We ask you to tell us what is the scale um, and then let us know what your GPA is within that scale. Um, 
if you have a school that does not provide a GPA, an overall GPA, you can calculate one for us and just include a little sentence in the academic section of the application that says, I calculated this because my transcript did not indicate an average GPA or a cumulative GPA. Great. All right. I know Rachel marked a couple too to be answered live. Um, the first one that I see that she marked was um, giving more detail on the organizational chart. How much should detail should be on there? Yeah, the org chart is a little bit more of an art than a science. So, you know, the um, it, it does not need to be an exact replica of your um, your real org chart, meaning that I don't need everyone's exact names and titles. Um, but, you know, we want to see a snapshot of what is relevant to um, the experience that you bring, you know, in the organization you're in. So if you work at Meta, we don't need all the way from the top to where you are. We need your um you know, your spotlight within that organization. So what is your department? Who are the groups you work with most commonly? Um, you know, who maybe reports up through you? What teams do you report up through? It doesn't have to be all the way up to the top, but whatever, um, you know, whatever makes most sense for, for you. Um, it's certainly okay to, um, you know, to, to exclude actual names and just use titles or um, give us, you know, different versions of things. We know a lot of org charts can contain a lot of sensitive information. So this again is also outlined in the application. We provide several examples within the application as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of context setting that we include in the instructions, but it's really just a tool for us to get a better sense of where you are and who you work with within your organization. Great. Could you talk a little bit about, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how the Career Development Office helps the Sloan Fellows students? Yep. So our Career Development Office team, our CDO team, has a dedicated team of advisors that really partner with um, Sloan Fellows students to create a customized plan for you. So um, it's a little bit different than what our traditional MBA experience um, looks like. And that's really because the Sloan Fellows students are coming with significant experience already that they're not necessarily fitting, um, you know, uh, a specific roadmap to follow because, you know, you may be, you might be, um, you know, already in an executive level role, um, but looking to make a pivot or looking to, um, you know, maybe potentially start your own um, entrepreneurial venture. So, you know, we are really dedicated to working with you for a customized um, kind of what we'll call plan of attack for a career outlook. Um, and, you know, the team of career advisors will meet with you from the beginning in the summer. We have all different types of assessment tools and programming that we offer to help get you up to speed. And then you have um, really a kind of customized search that you'll do um, with a lot of the insight and a lot of the guidance of the career development advisors, as well as um, different resources at MIT, whether it be the Trust Center for Entrepreneurship or any of the different um, tracks that we offer um, focused on, you know, sustainability or finance or, you know, there's lots of different kind of groups, working groups at Sloan that um, can serve as a resource as well. But rest assured that our career development advisors will partner with you from the beginning to make sure that you have a successful outcome. Great. Okay. I have another question here. Um, you answered some questions about letters of recommendation. This question is about if a candidate is, is high up in their company or is a CEO or founder of a firm and company, who would you recommend um, provide those letters? Yeah, um, for individuals who are already um, kind of the most senior person in their organization, you could um, ask someone who maybe is on a board of advisors or a professional advisor that you have, um, or, um, you know, if there's, uh, you know, an industry partner or, you know, a client um, that's of kind of similar stature that that could make sense as well. It's really, you know, somebody who can kind of speak to your professional experiences and um, professional success. Okay, great. Another question about candidates who do have the 10 plus years of experience came through, but have recently been promoted into management roles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we, how can a, an applicant show their um, leadership potential if they're just really starting out in those leadership positions? 
Yeah, if you're just starting in a leadership position, you know, we'd be interested in learning a bit more about how you've been able to influence things to date. And that maybe doesn't um, come necessarily from your direct reports, but maybe previous examples of how you've been able to, you know, drive change or manage projects without so much authority um, that you would maybe see on an org chart. Um, but, you know, how you've been able to, um, you know, drive change within teams or within organizations you've been a part of. Okay, great. And then when we're talking about calculating the years of experience, one of the questions came through is if we consider advanced degrees um, as work experience. We do not. We do not include um, advanced degrees as work experience. This would be, you know, full-time traditional professional experience. And really we're looking for that minimum of about 10 years um, because this is a program that is um, teaching you at an accelerated pace and really using that past experience as a foundation to be able to teach at a um, at a at a faster pace. Um, you know, if you have less than ten years of experience, you know, the good news is we have the traditional MBA that that could be a good match for you as an alternative. And I did see a few questions about the main differences between the Sloan Fellows and our traditional MBA. So if you could talk about that, that would be helpful. Yeah, well, certainly the time it takes to complete the degree is the, the biggest sort of fundamental difference. Um, the two-year MBA is obviously two years. It starts in September and you graduate, um, you know, about two years later in June, um, where the Sloan Fellows is one, one year, a 12-month program. It's the summer uh, fall and spring. But the other big fundamental difference is the Sloan Fellows MBA does not provide time for an internship. Um, and so the two-year MBA is great um, for people who are really looking to make a pivot or make a change and um, especially need that internship in order to gain the exposure or experience in something they don't otherwise have exposure to, to kind of leverage that for um, full-time work experience after. Um, so the lack of internship and the, the kind of faster um, pace of, of the Sloan Fellows experience um, are the key chain are the key differentiators. Also, we have people in the Sloan Fellows program who have 25 to 30 years of experience, who have been, you know, who are C-level executives already, who are in, um, you know, uh, who hold significant um, leadership roles within the public sector or the governments that they're from. Um, and so, you know, the, the discussion in the classroom is much different. It's really, you know, taking... Um, you know, taking things to a different level based on um, the experience that's represented in the class in the room. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's quite different than what you would experience um, in a program where the average experience is only five years. Okay, great. And we touched on this. If you could, if you wouldn't mind, one of our guests missed the slide about interviews, was asking if we could go back to that and talk a little bit more about, um, you know, some of the things we're looking for in these interviews. Uh, well, this is the timeline for the interviews. So you can see the deadline is on January 11th. We'll take the first you know, two weeks, maybe two plus weeks, three weeks to um, read through all of the applications that come in um, and use those um, assessments to determine who to invite to interview. And then interviews will take place for two to three weeks, depending on numbers um, through mid-February. Um, if you're invited to interview, obviously it's a good sign. We typically interview about half or so of the applicants who apply to the Sloan Fellows Program. Um, and you know the interviews are gonna highlight um, these characteristics and competencies that are similar to what we're looking for in the written application. So it's really um, what we call a combination of factors that make up leadership skills or leadership attributes. Um, and we're you know, essentially looking to better understand how you've been able to achieve success at whatever it is you've been doing by working in a collaborative way, by solving problems, by being innovative in the way you approach things and being able to gain the buy-in that you need in order to drive that change. We're looking for you to be an effective communicator um, and you know, ability to kind of build a, a strong rapport with your colleagues. Um, so these are all um, evidence-based um, characteristics that we would solicit from um, behavioral questions we ask you, like, you know, tell me about a situation where, you know, things didn't go according to your plan. Um, and then, you know, maybe a series of follow-up questions based on how you would answer that question, 
or a situation where you had to, um, you know, work with someone who you found to be challenging, you know, how did you work through that? So, you know, lots of different kind of basic behavioral questions that touch on these different characteristics and skills. Um, and then based on the initial answer you give us, maybe digging a little bit deeper with some follow-up questions. Um, and then finally, at the end of the interview, we always ask um, why you're interested in the Sloan Fellows MBA. You know, this is quite a unique program out there. There's only a couple peer programs to it right now. Um, and and, you know, we're we're looking to bring students in that not only are a match for us, but that we're a match for you, that, you know, we can help you to meet your objectives with this degree and this experience. Um, and it is unique. There's It's only one year. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking for kind of a match on both sides. So really be prepared to kind of explain why this is a good match for you. Um, and then, of course, we're always um, leaving time at the end of each interview to answer any questions that you might have. Great. We do have a few reapplicants who've joined the call. So if you have any advice for our reapplicants. Yeah, reapplicants. Um, we love reapplicants. A lot of people, um, you know, stick with it and are successful um, a second or even a third time around. Um, if you are um, a reapplicant, it's important to know that um, we will look at your original application alongside your new application. So the good news for you is you have kind of twice as much um, real estate or um, application materials for us to consider as other applicants. Um, and it's also an opportunity for you to give us something a little different than what you did in the past. So, um, you know, don't repeat exactly what you submitted last year, you know, make modifications to um, your cover letter or to your video. Um, it's always a good idea if you have another person to ask for a recommendation letter, if you applied, you know, um, previously um, and, and, you know, it, it would be a lost opportunity, I think, to ask the same person to write the same letter again. Um, you know, we'd be looking for um, insight from somebody else just because we'll have that original application alongside as well. Okay, great. We do have a lot of international students here who join the call. And so their questions are about visa, the visa process, um, if admitted in round two or round three for Sloan Fellows. Yeah, um, the MIT International Students Office will um, provide you some guidance on how to secure a visa. Um, if you apply in round two, it sh you should have plenty of time. Um, you know, once we release decisions in mid-February, that does give you um, three months or so to work on that visa. Um, if, if you apply in round three, it, it can be a little bit trickier. Um, you know, obviously, the more time you have, the, um, the easier that visa process is facilitated. Um, some countries take longer than others, and then certainly with COVID and ongoing COVID restrictions, um, there's been a, a longer um, a longer delay to securing those visas. But you know, we will work with you to provide you the guidance um, that, that you need to secure that visa to get the I twenty. Um, but you know, if you're admitted through either round, you know, it's just important to be timely. And, you know, as soon as you're admitted, make that decision to accept our offer and then begin the process of um, securing that visa. Um, really, you know, most of our students, almost all students we admit are successful in getting their visa in time to be here for um, the year they apply. Um, but, you know, if for some reason there's something that happens and um, things are delayed, you know, we would work with you to potentially um, uh, defer your admission by a year um, in order to allow you the time you need to secure that visa. Great, thanks. And I'm jumping a little bit all over. There is a question from a few of our candidates about um, any gaps in their resume for time off um, with families or other reasons. And so how would you like candidates to explain that in their application? Yep, um, totally understandable. Lots of people have breaks or gaps in their resume um, for a number of different reasons. In the um, employment section of the application, we offer a short text box for you to address any, um, any gaps in employment. So you can definitely um, use that space in the application. It's optional. Um, but if there's a more significant reason that maybe um, is a bigger headline in your application, you might want to talk about that in the cover letter as well. Oh. 
Okay, great. And and keeping on that note, um, how do um, Sloan Fellows, how are Sloan Fellows supported if they are moving with their families? Sloan is an amazing place um, for everybody who comes with you for your degree program experience, significant others and um, children and family members. Um, so we have a number of resources for students and their um, and their extended families through um, you know different resources that we offer on campus. Um, the visa process, you know, depending on your um, spouse or significant other status, we can um, you know help support um, the the process of securing visas um, for you and your children um, and your significant other to um, to join us here in the United States. Um, we have daycare facilities, um, three, in fact, on MIT's campus to help support you um, and your children. Um, and then we have a number of different resources from, you know, the Significant Others of Sloan Club to the um, Partners um, and Significant Others of MIT Club. Um, you know, overall, just kind of thinking big picture, you know, at MIT, we have more graduate students enrolled in studies across the Institute than we have um, undergraduate students. And graduate students bring um, lots of, um, you know, additional pieces with them, including significant others and family members. So, um, you know, there's lots of things they can get involved with. What's also great about this unique Sloan Fellows experience is, you know, everyone who's coming to study in the Sloan Fellows program is a little bit later on in their career. Um, everybody has someone else with them. Um, so we're trying to create an extended community for all of you to know each other. We have lots of social events and networking opportunities. Um, everyone's invited to an orientation program in April as well. So, um, you know, we really try to facilitate this um, unique Sloan Fellows community experience um, for both their students and everyone who comes with them to study. Great. Can you spend a little time talking about the 60 second video? Yes, I know this can be a little bit of um, a stressful part of the application for applicants. However, um, I know it's our admissions committees, um, one of our favorite pieces of the application because it really gives us a sense of your personality and who you are. Um, so this is a one minute video that's really designed for you to have control over the video, but for you in a simple way to kind of talk to the camera and, you know, like I said before, hypothetically introduce yourself to your future classmates. Um, you know, we're hoping to gather more about you here than what we would see on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile. Um, it's a great chance for us to, you know, see a little bit more into your personality, um, you know, hear from your voice, um, you know, how you would introduce yourself. Um, a, a similar way to think about this would be if you were going to kind of a professional networking event and you were standing at a table and, a, um, you know, some other colleagues came up to you, how would you introduce yourself? You might talk a little bit about your background or where you're from, what you do, um, but you might talk about, you know, what you did last weekend or what you plan to do, um, you know, with hobbies or, you know, kind of outside interests from work. Um, you know, it's just a chance for us to kind of get to know you beyond your, that kind of um, cookie cutter professional background set of um, questions that we're asking in the application. Okay, another question we're having is the weight of a GPA versus some of the um, experience on the resume that our applicants will submit. So just the weight of different application components. Yeah, so it's it's um, it's different for everyone. So we're looking for a combination of factors to communicate that you will be successful in an MIT classroom. And so, um, if your undergraduate coursework, um, you know, isn't as strong as you'd like, then we'd certainly look for evidence of sort of academic potential through um, the quantitative nature of your work experience or through a test score or through, you know, um, additional professional certifications or non-degree courses that you've taken. Um, and so, yes, it, it all, um, it all 
uh, is taken into account and um, is analyzed to kind of better understand what we call your demonstrated success is or what your, you know, um, academic capability is. Um, so I don't worry so much about, you know, a GPA from 20 years ago. We understand you're more than that today. Um, but, you know, we'd be looking for you to kind of point out to us some of the more, um, you know, quantitative successes that you've had in the work experience that you've done so far. Rachel, I saw one question come in. I'm not sure if you saw it. Um, asking about if they are going to take the EA or GMAT or GRE and the score comes in just a smidge after the deadline, what will that look like? Yep, that's a great question. Um, so we're happy to take an updated test score, updated um, application components, um, you know, within a few days or maybe a week or so of the deadline. Um, however, you did see this, um, this timeline is pretty quick. So, you know, we are, as soon as the deadline passes um, on the 12th, we begin reading through all the applications. And if you send us an update to your application after we've read your application, we can't guarantee we have enough capacity to go back and reevaluate. So as close to that deadline as possible is great. Um, but if you're taking an updated, if you're taking a test or you get have an updated test score within a couple of days of the deadline, you know, by all means, send it to us. Um, we just, the, the closer we get to that, you know, interview decision or um, final decision date, um, the less capacity we have to go back and reevaluate. I'm looking through all these questions. A lot no. of them, you know, we've already answered. Um, you know, Catherine I, I, also shared in the chat um, other resources. So they know a lot of these are not application focused. So um, there is a really great link that Catherine shared in the chat that I would encourage folks to look at. Um, yeah, there's so I saw a couple of questions. We do have uh, merit based scholarships available for students. We admit to the <laughs> small fellows program. If you receive a fellowship, you'd find out about that at the time of admission. Um, important to note that um, fellowship or scholarship dollars are limited and um, no one is receiving a full fellowship or full tuition fellowship, but we do have a number of small awards that we offer. Um, I saw a question about G-Lab, um, Global Entrepreneurship Lab initiatives and where students are able to go um, to study. So um, just this month, students are leaving right now to go on um, a number of different um, projects that are all based all over the world. Um, the action learning um, lab section of our website um, should provide some updates on where students are headed this January. And if they haven't yet, I'm sure they will be updating it within the next few days. Um, students are literally traveling this week to their um, host projects. Um, Sloan Fellows MBA students, of course, are able to get involved in any of the student clubs or any of the different extracurricular activities that Sloan and MIT has to offer. By no means are you limited to, um, you know, just a Sloan Fellows community. You are, um, you are a student of MIT. You have that MIT ID card. You're able to get involved in a number of different things. Um, and certainly everything that Sloan has to offer is available to you. Um, our foreign minors of Sloan Fellows students, so our, I guess, dependents of Sloan Fellows students who are not from the U.S. able to attend school in the U.S.? Yes, they are. Anybody who travels with you, as long as they're on an appropriate visa, which our international students office will help to support, um, you know, any your children are able to enroll in um, public school or private school here in the United States. Um, it's working. So the problem is you have to make sure you would apply for the correct visa in order for your spouse um, to be able to work in the United States. Um, let's see, what other questions? A lot of these are similar. Um, so if you are admitted on February 14th, what's the timeline to commit to the offer uh, and pay the deposit? Um, I think it's by um, sometime in early March. Um, so it, it's a bit of a quick turnaround. It's usually um, two to three weeks after the decisions um, are released. Um, I don't know. Anyone else behind the scenes here have any questions they've seen that I haven't been able to get to? Good. 
Great. Well, I think that we've done a great job. We've answered lots of questions. Um, you know, thank you all for joining us. As I said at the beginning, we're really excited to dig into your applications and learn more about your backgrounds and your stories. Um, and um, that application deadline is coming up next week on the 11th. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, or anything else that comes up, you can always reach out to us over email. And here's the email address for the Sloan Fellows team. Um, and you know, one more time, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who helped behind the scenes, Catherine, Pam, Alexis and Rachel. Um, and, you know, we'll look forward to learning more about all of your backgrounds um, after the deadline next week. Thanks so much.